Ms. Dean, why don't you sit over here? Sorry to be late, and um, I want to welcome all of you to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. The Wilson Center is the living memorial to our 28th president, our only PhD president, and the only one buried in Washington, D.C. It's much more than that, of course. Um, but uh, the subject today is in the Wilson Center. It's uh, a discussion of one voice, and I'm really happy that my friend and colleague, Mark Ginsburg, is here with us today, and as Alino Mussery, who's the director of the One Voice office in Gaza. Um, Mark, if you don't mind, I, 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 I wonder if you could start off um, by talking about One Voice, and then you'll hear some fascinating insights and perceptions from Ezeldine, who will talk about his experiences in Gaza, prospects for reconciliation, and how One Voice um, seeks to, to do its work on the ground in Gaza, which must be a Challenging. Very difficult and challenging situation. So, uh, Mark, thank you very thank much. You. Is there anything I need to hit here? Uh, no, I think you're. Yeah. I think you're good to go. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out and appreciate Aaron. Uh, thank you for hosting us and thank you. Uh, thank you for everything that to put this together. And uh, I just want to say a few words. In 1978, I served as deputy senior advisor to the president on Camp David negotiations in Palestinian post-autonomy negotiations. And here I am now as the CEO of the One Voice Movement and Foundation as well as PeaceWorks. Uh, the One Voice Movement uh, has offices in uh, Ramallah, Gaza, Tel Aviv, as well as in Washington and in New York and uh, London. And the organization which was founded by Daniel Lebetsky, who is an entrepreneur uh, in the United States, a very very, uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the kind, healthy snack food bars. That's Daniel's company. He's devoted his considerable wealth to helping to uh, educate and mobilize the next generation of Palestinians and Israelis on behalf of pursuing a two-state solution in the Middle East. And I uh, met Daniel a year ago and decided to take this on uh, in order to throw a considerable amount of attention on the carry negotiations and the need to create, shall we say, the ground game necessary among Palestinians and Israelis to support the, uh, a two-state solution. Now, uh, the organization with the staff, full-time staff, 39, and 700 uh, youth leaders in, in Palestine, as well as almost 1,700 in Israel, and we have Tal Harris with us who is the uh, executive director of One Voice Israel on sabbatical here in the United States. Uh, Christina Forstein, who is with us, and Shana Lowe, who is, uh, who is also on our staff. Uh, our goal has been to uh, come up with the most creative ways using social media as well as uh, grassroots activities to convince Israelis and Palestinians that in the final analysis, no matter how many hiccups Secretary Kerry engages in, uh, and those were his words, not mine, uh, that we are determined to, per to persevere in a two-state solution. One Voice Israel in particular, and I've focused a lot of my energies there, in fact, as I just said goodbye to Ez at the Erez crossing a few weeks ago in Gaza before he came to the United States. Uh, he went back and then we brought him back here. Shall we say we sprung him from Gaza. Uh, our goal in Israel has been uh, twofold. One, to generate support within the Knesset in a parliamentary democracy and to hold Knesset members directly accountable to their constituents in support of a peace process where most Israelis, I think it would be safe to say, uh, consider what's going on on the other side of the Green Line to be alien territory to them. Their familiarity with Palestinians on a day-to-day -day basis has evaporated. Uh, most of them do not, and I'm talking about now the generation that I'm targeting, the younger adults, have no real familiarity with the conflict, the historical basis of the conflict, and the grievances. They are caught up in their, shall we say, apathetic lives. Uh, and the conflict is about as far away from their attentions as you can possibly imagine. We are far more focused here in the ins and outs of the negotiations than they are. And our goal has been to wake them up. Uh, so what have we done? And I'll just be very quick. We launched a recent campaign entitled Peace It Also Pays Off to show young Israelis, younger family Israelis, 
that the costs of the occupation uh, are considerable to the, out of their pockets uh, and that the settlement enterprise is robbing them of the, of, the, of the hope of future that they need for both security as well as economic security. Uh, in terms of our mobilization in the wake of the breakdown in negotiations, I'm sure that will come up in the, in the questions. You weren't here to, you didn't come here to hear me. You came here to hear my hero. Think about it. Under, very, under the very noses of Hamas, One Voice, the only organization that supports a two-state solution, is able to operate in Gaza. And the fact that Ezzeldin Masri, for seven years, has been there is a testament to his dedication, his belief in peace, his belief in reconciliation, and more importantly, to the challenges he and his family have faced and his willingness to overcome them. And so I'm very grateful, Aaron, that you have permitted us to introduce Ezeldin to this distinguished group of people who've come here today. I'm sure that what he has to say will, you will find fascinating. Mark, thank you. Thank you. Ezeldin? Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm very thankful for this uh, meeting, and I'm very thankful for the opportunity to give me the chance to bring a message of peace from Palestine, and in particular from the Gaza Strip. Uh, as a Dean in Masri, I was born in the Gaza Strip, in the northwestern part of the Gaza Strip, in a city called the Beit Lahia, right on the Mediterranean beach, and we have borders with the state of uh, Israel. Uh, in 1990, uh, I was uh, in the Gaza Strip. I just had finished my uh, high school. I was a member of the uh, united leader of the uprising in the north of the Gaza Strip uh, took part in resisting the Israeli occupation, spray painting on the walls and enforcing strikes, uh, throwing stones, and then my father decided that either you would get killed or you would be in uh, prison, and it's better for you to join your uh, uncles in uh, Chicago and go study over there. So he sent me to Chicago. I was 18 years old. I attended North Eastern Illinois University in the north side of Chicago, where I studied criminology and political science. And then I did my master's in conflict resolution, and I focused on the notion of preventive diplomacy and the Oslo Agreement. I returned to Gaza, to Gaza in 2003. I worked with the American International School. I became assistant principal. And then I moved to work with American organization called Amidist. It administers the Fulbright uh, Scholarship and also the GRE and the TOEFL. Uh, in 2006, uh, Ambassador Majd al Khaldi, who is assistant to the president for the peace process, uh, nominated me for Daniel Lapitsky, the founder of One V, One Voice. And Daniel came to uh, uh, appoint me as the director of uh, Gaza office. Uh, Working and representing uh, one voice in the Gaza Strip is very challenging, in particular because we don't have the privilege, like our officer Ramallah, they have the support of the president and they have the support of the Palestinian Authority, they have the support of the PLO. So working in the Gaza Strip uh, is very challenging. Very challenging because the notion of the two-state solution, uh, which the PLO had ab uh, adopted in the PNC uh, meeting in Alger in uh, 1988 uh, is a notion uh, that involves uh, hysterical concessions on the part of the Palestinian people, hysterical concessions that the PLO uh, did not work enough in order to prepare the Palestinian people to accept these uh, hysterical, grand some concessions. For example, uh, we grow up knowing that Palestine extends uh, from the Red Sea to the Lebanese border, or from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean. Palestine is 27,000 square kilometer. All of this belongs to the Palestinian people. But here the PLO and uh, Mr. Yasser Arafat, uh, peace be upon him, he decided in 1988 that for the sake of peace, for the sake of ending the conflict with the state of Israel, for the sake of the resurrection of the state of Palestine, to put Palestine back on the geopolitical map, he decided to accept UN Security Council Resolution 242. And also he and the PLO decided that enough 22% of historical Palestine, which amount to only roughly 6,000 square kilometer. And also the two-state solution involves the hugest concessions on part of the Palestinian people, uh, uh, which is almost the abandonment of the right of return. 
Now, my father is a native Gazans. My mother comes from the Sea of Galilee region, from a town or a city known as uh, Safad. And my grandfather, he died as a refugee in a Yarmouk refugee camp in uh, Syria. So here you are representing an international organization, One Voice Movement, uh, trying to bring a conclusion and end to the century-old Israeli-Palestinian conflict based on a two-state solution. A two-state solution, as I mentioned, that involves uh, concessions on behalf of the Palestinian people. And uh, the PLO did not concentrate enough on preparing the ground for uh, the two-state solution. What does that mean? It means that uh, we go, we conduct town hall meetings like the one I have in here. At this town hall meeting uh, was done in uh, Jabalia refugee uh, camp. And here you see you have the university students. Uh, and uh, here I am. I have a map projecting uh, the West Bank. And uh, I, I tell them what is resolution 242 that calls for Israel to withdraw to the 1967 borders. I, here, I, I am pointing toward the green line, which is supposed to be the borders of the state of uh, Palestine. And uh, I tell them that uh, in order to have a Palestinian state, uh, we must accept a Palestinian state and only 22% of historical Palestine, and it will encompass the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Uh, for example, here I also explain to them that uh, about the Israeli settlements. Uh, now, uh, according to the position of the state of Israel, there are almost uh, around 200 settlements. Most of them uh, are away from the green line, and some of them Israel decided to call legal settlements, and some Israel decided to call illegal uh, settlements. Now, according to the international law and the Geneva Fourth Convention, all the settlements are illegal in a conquered uh, state. Uh, but I explained to them uh, uh, that the state of Israel uh, proposed that it's willing to abandon most of the settlements uh, <coughs> and keep, for example, uh, three uh, settlements blocks, the north one called Ariel, Ma'ari Adumim in the middle, and Gosh Asyon uh, in the south. And I explained to them what is meant by the notion of uh, land swap, for example. Uh, we also talk about, uh, for example, uh, what Mahmoud Abbas, our president, has proposed in order to make peace uh, possible uh, to bring, uh, for example, a contingent of uh, uh, American Jews from the U.S. Army. And Secretary of State uh, John Kerry told him we don't have such a thing in America. So uh, Abbas said, how about if we bring NATO to stand on the uh, borders? Uh, we talk about President Abbas uh, <laughs> saying uh, that uh, for, uh, he has a solution for Jerusalem. Uh, how about if we have Jerusalem an open city? We have uh, a council that governs uh, Western Jerusalem, one that governs Eastern Jerusalem, and we'll have a higher body that a council that governs both. Uh, we talk about uh, Mahmoud Abbas and his position in regard to the right of return. Now, this is the throniest issue. And this is the essence of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're talking about almost 450 Palestinian villages and cities that were destroyed during the 1948 Arab-Israeli war. We're talking about almost 5 million Palestinian refugees living miserable conditions in Sabra and Shatela refugee camp, in Al-Wahdat camp, in al Yarmouk camp, also Palestinian diaspora, almost 5 millions. Those 5 million Palestinian refugees for the past 66 years lived according to uh, the position of the PLO that most of them will be allowed to go back into their homes and to their cities. Now, the two-state solution <laughs> doesn't dictate that. Uh, we, I, we, we tell them about the, 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 the position of our President Mahmoud Abbas, that for the sake of having an independent homeland for the Palestinian people, he went on TV and said that he's willing to forfeit uh, the right of return to go back to Safad, and he is content with the Palestinian state and the 1967 borders. Uh, our work is, is, is made possible by the presence of President Mahmoud Abbas. President Mahmoud Abbas is a strong believer of the two-state solution. Uh, President Mahmoud Abbas supports the work that One Voice uh, does, and that gives us uh, legitimacy. Uh, also in the Gaza Strip, uh, we work on uh, training, and uh, this is a picture uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, in parallel to the town hall meetings, and in the Q&A question, 
uh, people who are interested in supporting the two-state solution. And I must be honest with you. For example, if I have an audience of 50 uh, people attending the town hall meeting, maybe roughly you can say less than half support the two-state solution. Why? Why? Because uh, not work enough was done in order to prepare the people to accept the two-state solution. So for those who support the two-state solution, they are invited to participate in a training program, basic training program under the leadership uh, development uh, title. And they undergo almost six months of training in areas like leadership development, in areas like uh, communication, in areas like conflict resolution, in subjects like uh, uh, negotiation. And this was uh, their graduation back in uh, Gaza City. Uh, One Voice uh, movement is peculiar among other organizations because it focuses on politics, uh, it focuses on preparing the ground for the two-state solution, uh, a job that should have been done a long time ago, but uh, we are trying in the West Bank, I also worked in the West Bank for almost three years, we have chapters namely in every city in the West Bank from Hebron, in the south to Jenin in the north. We have a body of almost uh, something around uh, a thousand volunteers who support uh, the movement. Uh, in the Gaza Strip, uh, our efforts are modest. Uh, as they say in America, uh, slowly but surely, we are moving toward that uh, direction. And uh, hopefully, uh, one day, we will make the impact uh, as long as uh, we have the support of our president, uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Thank you very much. Ezzeldin, thank you very much. Um, Hala, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to introduce you. Uh, for, forgive me. Hala is Fandiari, the director of the Middle East program at the, at the Wilson Center. Before we go to your questions and answers, I, I have one question for, for Mark, for Ez. Um, and that's this. If George Mitchell were here, were here, he might say to you that the Good Friday Agreement was made possible not just because of his own efforts, but because the public constituencies on both sides of the conflict either were exhausted, frustrated, angry, and tired of the politicians, the violence, and the paras. Now, I've watched this conflict for a long time, and one of its most unique features is the capacity of leaders to insulate their publics from the costs and consequences of the perpetuation and continuation of the conflict. I have theories about why this is true, but I, I, what, I, what I'd really like to know is why is it, why is it that public opinion seems not to be able to serve, it constrains more than it facilitates. It limits the capacities of leaders to act rather than impels them to do so. I mean, on the Israeli side, you never saw, with, with rare exception, probably over Lebanon, massive demonstrations in the streets uh, in protest of government policies on, uh, toward the Palestinians or even campaigning for peace. There was a, a brief moment, perhaps, surrounding the activities of the late Prime Minister Rabin. And on the Palestinian side, I know Palestinians are under occupation. I know that they will always, um, before blaming their own leaders, the tendency, uh, quite understandably, is to blame the Israelis or the Americans or the callousness of the international community. But this is a very curious question to me. Why don't the publics, how come they're not motivated, more motivated, to essentially create the basis for an end to the conflict? Well, I, I, I'm going to only anecdotally answer that uh, because I was just in Israel, and the challenge that we face at the grassroots level among Israelis is that, the sta first of all, the status quo is, seems perfectly acceptable to vast swaths of the Israelis in terms of the fact that the security barrier has accomplished more than I think even they had imagined. It not only ceased most of the terrorism that was occurring within the Green Line, but it also, for more or less in purposes, pushed the conflict uh, and the boiling season, fire-breathing dragons 
that constitute a conflict out of their minds. It doesn't affect their day-to-day -day lives, number one. Number two, a couple of weeks ago, Prime Minister Netanyahu was in the United States and he gave what essentially I would call a tour de force speech at the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee in which he talked and extolled the virtues of peace, peace with the Palestinians. Uh, I read the speech and then wrote a piece and essentially said the following to him. I challenged him, Mr. Prime Minister, I will go in front of your home and eat my right shoe if you deliver that same speech in Hebrew to the Israelis, okay? He hasn't done so. In order for Israelis to be convinced that there's benefits rather than liabilities to peace, you need to have leaders who are prepared to show them the way. Number one. Number two, in spite of all of Secretary Kerry's efforts, and they were honorable and dignified, and I respect them, I respect his commitment and his determination, and I have nothing but admiration for what he's tried to do. He himself never really addressed the Israeli public about the benefits of peace. And finally, you cannot underestimate, Aaron, the power of the financing and resources and determination of those elements of the Israeli government and the Settlers Council who are spending huge amounts of money against any, all of our efforts uh, to build a constituency for peace. When we were launching our initiatives in, to support the Secretary, a vilification campaign against John Kerry was launched by the Yesha Council. Uh, financed, by the way, as we found out, by money from the Israeli government. Now, when you're facing that type of resources and determination and a united front against negotiations, and the peace camp and the coalition in favor of peace is so disorganized, you don't have leadership within Israel to convince Israelis that concessions could lead them to a promised land as compared to the status quo that they feel comfortable in right now. Is the moon and the yeah. Palestinian side? And the, and the Palestinian side. Uh, unlike here in the United States and the Western world, and maybe also inside Israel, wh where the leaders are affected by the polls and what the polls suggest, uh, in Palestine, uh, we are part of the Eastern world, the Oriental world. Uh, uh, yes, uh, يعني, you can take an airplane and within 12 hours you can leave uh, uh, Jerusalem or Amman or Cairo and come to America. But it's like going, I say, to a different planet, okay? Different universe. Uh, in, in Arabia, we are a patriarchal society. Uh, we look up to our uh, elders. Uh, we look up to our uh, president. And uh, uh, maybe I need to remind you that uh, prior to the Oslo Agreement, uh, we used to throw Molotov cocktails at the Israelis. We used to throw stones at the Israelis. But once uh, Yasser Arafat in the Rose Garden shook hands with uh, Ishaq Rabin, we went out and we started to put the flowers uh, in the uh, M16s of the Israeli armies and throw flowers at the Israeli jeeps. So what matters is the president himself, uh, the chairman himself. Whatever he says, he will find uh, open ears uh, among the Palestinians. So uh, at least as a Palestinian, I want to say that Mahmoud Abbas tried all what he can. And for the past 50 years, he had chased the, the state of Israel in order to strike a deal based on the 1967 borders. What else Mahmoud Abbas can do? Uh, put a big uh, menorah in the in Ramallah or where uh, be, uh, turn out to be uh, Jewish, okay? He tried all what he can do. And uh, he doesn't have a, uh, an open ear on the Israeli side. He got Benjamin Netanyahu to deal with. A person, uh, personally, as Palestinian, I read his book, A Nation Under the Sun, and I know what he said inside that book. He doesn't believe in the two-state solution. He doesn't believe in giving up the hills of Judea and Samaria, as he called, uh, tries to call it. He doesn't want to give back East Jerusalem to be our capital. So for us Palestinians, we have the leader, we have the president to make peace with the state of Israel based on the 1967 border. But on the Israeli side, we need maybe someone else who believes in a two-state solution. Okay. Um, Hala, how are you? I'm waiting for the mic because you know. Okay. Uh, 
Um, you mentioned that Mahmoud Abbas is, you know, your president and so on. What about the followers of Haniya? This is, I mean, they exist too. Yes, they know? do. So, so, what do they want? And now, I mean, this unification, where is that going to go? Okay, just like the Israeli society, just like the Israeli political system, where you have merits and where you have the Labour Party in their platform, they recognize the need for a Palestinian state and in the occupation, and the right of merits and the, and the right of labor, you have Beta Yehudi with Vinay Bennett who believes in annexing the, 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 the West Bank and uh, orchestrating an uh, apartheid system, okay? So in the Palestinian side, we have people who are moderates, like Mahmoud Abbas, we have the People Party, we have the secular, and also to the right of them, Yes, we have Mahmoud Haniyeh and uh, Ismail Haniyeh representing Hamas, and we have also Jihad Islami. We have maximalists, just like in Israel they have maximalists. But uh, I, I assure you that if there is election tomorrow within the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Gaza, I believe that the people will opt to vote more for the Mahmoud Abbas than with Ismail Haniyeh. And this uh, primarily has to do with the fact that the maximalists represented by Hamas, they are not pragmatists, they didn't know how to deal with the international community, therefore they brought hardship, economic sanction on the Gaza Strip, and people does, don't want to replicate what happened in 2006 and bring economic sanctions upon themselves, therefore they will vote more for pragmatic and uh, more uh, for Fatah than Hamas. Yes. Okay, why don't we go to questions. Please identify yourselves in, in the interest of time and uh, multiple questions. Please keep the questions short and ask questions. <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, Mohammed Hussaini from the Arab League. Uh, as a Palestinian, I would like to ask you, was this the right moment really for the Palestinian to go into negotiation with all the chaos and turmoil in the Arab countries? Like Many Arab countries really are very important for peace or war, like Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. Wouldn't have been better that they should have waited, especially that the Israelis feel more comfortable with the, with the status quo now. Why should they go for peace? And that's why Netanyahu has put some demands which are unacceptable to the Palestinian. Why now, then? Why now? Because the United States, since, 980, uh, since 1988, uh, since the inception of the peace process, practiced something that is called monopoly over the peace process. The United States doesn't allow the, so the uh, Russians or the European Union to really take an effective part in the negotiation. On the other hand, the United States uh, wanted exclusively to uh, be the sponsor of the negotiation. Mahmoud Abbas uh, uh, did not withstand the pressure of the United States, and therefore uh, Secretary of State John Kerry had convinced him and actually dragged him into this uh, negotiation. Now, I'm not sure if Mahmoud Abbas uh, was optimistic about this uh, peace uh, negotiation with the State of Israel, but at least Mahmoud Abbas, it, يعني, he didn't want to say no to the Americans. He didn't want to look like Yasser Arafat uh, in the Camp David uh, too. That's why Mahmoud Abbas decided mm -hmm. to go to the negotiation. Add to that, uh, as Palestinians, we have over 5,000 Palestinian political prisoners inside Israel, and we like to call those uh, prisoners of war because they did not go inside the Israeli prison because they stole a car or because they did something. They went there because they wanted to liberate their country, and uh, this is in all international conventions is allowed for a nation uh, to try to fight and to get its, uh, its land back. So Mahmoud Abbas have a pressure from within the Palestinian society in order to release prisoners, and he was uh, able to release uh, prisoners who were imprisoned before the Oslo Agreement. So two reasons, the pressure of the United States and also uh, him wanted to release Palestinian uh, prisoners. Yes. My name is Tom Gatman. I'm an NGO executive and I worked in the West Bank and Gaza and in South Africa. Um, when the, when the South Africans were negotiating, Mr. Mandela said, please don't 
participate in this with us because we need to do it ourselves. So if there are mistakes, we take the blame for the mistakes. Is there a possibility that Israelis and Palestinians can negotiate without an outside intervener? And if it is somebody from outside, like an American Secretary of State, uh, do you think it'll work next time? Who are you directing the question to? Mr. Masri. Yes. Uh, there is a, a symmetrical relation between the state of Israel and the Palestinians. We live under uh, direct military occupation. Uh, therefore, uh, we don't have uh, the freedom of movement. We don't have the freedom of speech. Uh, anyone, us Palestinians, can be subject to arrest or administrative uh, detention. So we are not at leisure to stand up uh, against the Israelis and have uh, unilateral negotiations one to one. We must have somebody to facilitate uh, the negotiation. And also, uh, us Palestinians, in comparison to Israel, Israel uh, is a very strong country. Israel considered one of the Western uh, industrial advanced countries. And we are a nation under occupation. Uh, so uh, we must have somebody uh, to be a me uh, mediator between us and the uh, Israelis. Th that helps a lot in order to facilitate uh, the negotiations. Uh, it's, it's very hard for a Palestinian to sit in front of an Israeli and try to negotiate and for the Israeli to uh, dictate. There must be a witness at least to what goes on in the negotiation. There must be someone in order to hold this person or that person accountable for the failure of the peace process. And that's where uh, the role of the United States uh, comes. But as Palestinian, I would love also for other nations, in particular the European Union, to be involved in the negotiation. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sharon Kotak, and I'm retired from the State Department. And I have a question for Ambassador Ginsburg. You, you, you mentioned that most Israelis are comfortable with the status quo. They feel secure that way. But isn't there a growing uh, number of, of Israelis who feel that Israel cannot maintain, remain a democratic state unless it, there is a two-state solution? Well, it's an excellent question. And, and all I can add, do to answer is that when Ariel Sharon and Ehud Olmert uh, devised their unilateral withdrawal from Gaza. And when Mr. Olmert, uh, who, as you know, has now been indicted for other reasons having nothing to do with the peace process, uh, had, was in, involved in negotiations directly with Mr. Abbas, it was quite evident from the statements that he was making that maintaining a Jewish majority inside Israel uh, was an essential component to the necessity of pursuing an active two-state solution enterprise. And his negotiations with, Mr. with President Abbas, uh, while they did not achieve anything that resembles a, an agreement, they were inspired on the fact that there are a considerable number of Israelis who recognize uh, the importance of, uh, shall we say, avoiding a situation where one morning the Palestinian Authority may be dissolved, uh, and the Israelis are basically left with a significant population that has said, fine, if you're not prepared to give us a state, we want to become citizens of Israel. Okay? Now, most Israelis that I speak to consider that to be something way off in the future that they don't have to worry about today. Okay? Now, that's, I'm, not, I'm not doing this scientifically. I'm merely saying to you. And yet, I think it would be, if I leave you with the impression that, Israel, that, the, that the vast majorities of Israelis do not want the conflict resolved, that is wrong. They want the conflict resolved. The question is, is what is it that they expect to get in return? They've, they themselves see this Hamas equation as a major reason why they can doubt any agreement that is being reached uh, with uh, the Palestinian Authority. They do not believe that the weakness of the Palestinian Authority can withstand what could be an agreement that would dissolve and leave the Israelis worse off than they were. Now, all of these equations require you to decide for yourself what is better or worse. 
And the, our goal for one voice is to make it abundantly clear to Israelis as well as to Palestinians. You have no alternative. You can hide your heads in, your, in the sand, but in the end, you're going to have to confront these realities. You might as well get them resolved now than waiting for them to get worse. Can I, can I just offer a, a brief comment since Mark and Isadine are in the peace business? Um, and that is this, that peace is an abstraction. If I were the king, uh, which I'm not, I would probably take the word, it's a wonderful word, it signifies and implies many wonderful things. But in this region, as it pertains to Arabs and Israelis, it is an abstraction. What you have in Egypt and Israel, and Israel and Jordan, are very significant agreements. But let's be clear, they're transactions. They're not transformations. And um, Israelis and Palestinians read this, and they know that peace is a deliverable is an extremely difficult thing to deliver in their neighborhood. Uh, discount the current realities, um, divisions within Israel, within the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian National Movement in a kind of crisis, the regional situation. This is part of the problem, and we all get drawn into it. We all have our expectations raised to very dangerous levels about what agreements and negotiations will actually produce even under the best of circumstances. I saw, the camp, I saw the play Camp David two weeks ago at Arena Stage. It's a remarkable play. Larry Wright did an extraordinary job. The acting is brilliant. Ron Rifkin does an unbelievable Menachem Begin. Uh, Khaled Nabawi does a Sadat, which is extraordinary. And he's produced an incredibly likable, uh, in Richard Thomas, Jimmy Carter. But that play demonstrates both the liabilities and the assets of, of negotiations. Neither side, neither Sadat nor Begin, saw this as a transformative experience. It was essentially a business proposition designed to serve a very narrow objective. And frankly, um, I support One Voice. I ran Seeds of Peace for, for several years. It's an extraordinary organization. I really think we need to get a grip here and understand what it is we're really talking about. I'd settle for peace as the absence of war right now between Israelis and Palestinians. I'd settle for a deal which resolved all the issues um, and left peace, transformation, as a generational proposition. Because frankly, that's the best you're gonna get. And because the distances are so small with Israelis and Palestinians and the problems loom so large, with implementation of a two-state solution. Suspicions are so deep and the traumas of history so profound. You're talking about trying to avoid the history, try to escape the forces of history and geography, which is unlike the Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty, unlike the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty, had there been an Israeli-Syrian agreement that led to a solution. This is something fundamentally different. Because Israelis and Palestinians, even with an agreement, will be caught up and bound by the forces of historical trauma and geography. And they may, they may or may not, in the case of geography, work to the advantage of the two sides. But I, I really think we got to get a grip and keep our expectations I, realistic I, and low. I hope you don't mind if I just take a two-finger intervention, and I don't mean to monopolize this, but the word that is circulating in Israel is not peace, but divorce. Okay, most Israelis want a divorce from the conflict. They have no expectation of any kumbaya moment in this, number one. Number two, in the wake of the breakdown of these negotiations, there's an enormous question on my mind about how unilateralism by both Israelis and Palestinians could wind up creating a de facto two-state solution that does not resolve the conflict, but leads to not a divorce, but an acrimonious divorce instead of a resolution of the conflict. It's so important for us to guard against the outcome of permitting the parties to take the easy way out and, and in effect create a de facto two-state solution that exacerbates this conflict and doesn't resolve it. 
Well, this could be an unprecedented situation. Actually, we have a question. Yes. Uh, Chris Bauman, Department of Defense, part of the team that's been helping Secretary Kerry's efforts. Um, you mentioned transactional versus transformational, and I'm wondering just to get to the transactional part, never mind the transformational, just to get to the transactional agreement, what conditions would have to change, what systemic shocks or whatever to bring the conflict to ripeness would occur that you would say, okay, it's time to move ahead from all three of you? All right. uh, the same thing that motivated other agreements in the Arab-Israeli arena, pain of a sufficient quantity and prospects of gain. That's why human beings take risks. That's why you had an Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. That's why Oslo, even though it never came to fruition, happened. And that's why Baker put together Madrid. They all occurred in the, in the wake of violence insurg and insurgency. In the case of Camp David, uh, Sadat's diplomacy, but that would never have occurred without the October 1973 war. To get Israelis and Palestinians to own this, which would create sufficient urgency to resolve it, that's what you need. You need pain and gain. And right now, as bad as we think the situation is, I don't think you have sufficient quantities of either. And no one in Washington, no Barack Obama, no John Kerry, can produce that artificially. Every breakthrough in this conflict has been preceded by localized pain and perhaps gain on which the United States actually then built some sort of process. Some worked, some didn't. But we never created, nor can we create, sufficient incentives and disincentives, in my judgment, for many reasons. Domestic politics, presidential priorities, the nastiness of the conflict, the determination of small tribes to resist great powers, all these reasons suggest profound limitations in our own role. That's a very sad and sober and annoyingly negative answer, but it is my answer. What would it take I mean, to resolve this? In my judgment, uh, there are plenty of Israelis uh, who have been elected to parliament. One voice under Tal's leadership uh, was able to help create the largest caucus in the Israeli Knesset for peace. And it's not by accident. We're at 43, 45 members. Now, 45 out of 120 is, is, is still quite, shall we say, a climb up the latter. But remember, 45 to 61 is the key here. Uh, there are vast swaths of the Israeli political system that want a two-state solution in an agreement with the Palestinians. And they are unfortunately in this parliamentary democracy, God bless it, are in the minority right now. And moreover, the institutional framework of the country in Israel that controls the settlement enterprise, the housing ministry, uh, has been more than prepared. Uh, it's almost as if how much can we do to create more facts on the ground to counter the possibilities of peace? And they don't represent a majority of Israelis either, but they have the levers of power because they're within a, in a coalition. Uh, I think the implication of what I'm saying is is that one voice's goal is to educate as many members of the Knesset who are sitting on the sidelines and who are, shall we say, not engaged in the, in the efforts to make peace, to get off the fence, okay? And that includes people like Tsipi Livni and Yair Lapid and many others who uh, are members of the coalition and who asserted that the reasons why they're part of this coalition is that because they will only be there if the negotiations for a two-state solution proceed. And yet, what we saw happen in the last few days is disturbing. Both Mr. Lapid and Ms. Livney have found it conveniently, uh, have found it convenient to, play, lay, to lay the blame on Mr. Abbas 
for the breakdown on the talks, uh, when in reality they should be laying the blame at the footsteps of the coalition prime minister that they're members of. Uh, irrespective of what Mr. Abbas did to uh, go to sign 15 conventions or seek to enter into you negotiations with Hamas, the fact of the matter is, is that the Israeli government failed to abide by a commitment it had made to release prisoners at a date certain that had been agreed to before. Uh, why are they not holding Mr. Netanyahu accountable for his breach of that commitment? Yes. Would the reunification of leadership of Hamas and PLO and PLO's leadership facilitate peace in your mind? And what is the you express a view that they, if there was an election, would PLO would have a strong position? I just want an opinion as to whether that, if that were to occur and there was to be an accommodation between Hamas and PLO, what impact would that have on peace? Now, when we talk about peace, we're talking about peace based on a two-state solution. I'm talking about peace based upon a two-state solution. Yes, states. we're talking about the Palestinian state and the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as the capital. Now, both Fatah and the PLO agreed to that in the PNC uh, meeting in 1988. And on the other hand, the maximalist Hamas and the founder of Hamas, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, who also agreed in 1988 that uh, if Israel withdraw from the 1967 uh, and for a Palestinian state to be established on the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as the capital of it, uh, he will not refuse that and he will welcome that and he will actually have peace with Israel for a hundred year, a truce for a hundred year. So on the Palestinian side, the Mac uh, Hamas and Fatah, we agree on a Palestinian state on the 1967 uh, borders. On the other hand, on the Israeli side, uh, they, 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 Israel has the power, like Sharon did. Sharon, he decided that he wants to withdraw from the Gaza Strip. He went and he did it. Like uh, Begin, he decided that he wants to do peace with the Egypt. He went and he withdrew from the Sinai Peninsula. What forbid Israel from waking up in the morning and saying, okay, uh, these, this is uh, the border and we will not build settlements beyond these borders. We will dismantle settlements beyond these borders. Uh, we want to recognize a Palestinian state. Israel has the, 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 the ball is in Israel's uh, court right now. Uh, we agreed for a Palestinian state on the 1967 borders. It's time for Israel also to come to terms with that and agree to grant Palestinians the right for self-determination on the border of 1967. Mr. Mahmoud Abbas, he tried all what he can do in order to prove that he wants that peace based on the 1967 border. Uh, he talked about he doesn't want to go back uh, to Safa. He talked about having made to stand on the borders, talking about shared uh, Jerusalem. He did all what he can do. Uh, for example, I wanted to mention, and, and I should mention, uh, the effort, uh, his, his assistant, Dr. Assam Sartawi, he was gunned down in Europe, he was assassinated in Europe by Abu Nadali group because of his uh, views. So, so, I mean, w w what else Mahmoud Abbas can do m m more than what he did let in, in sake for peace? Let me just add a quick point. It's very important, and uh, it's a whole separate seminar to understand how these elections are going to play out if they play out. The, the elections for the Palestinian National Council, the elections for the Palestinian Liberation Council, uh, Legislative Council, and the elections directly for the President of the Palestinian Authority. Each one of these steps has enormous consequences for how the ultimate picture evolves insofar as unification. This is probably not the right time or place, but I merely will say to you what Ez and I understand that it is very conceivable if these elections are permitted to continue and these candidates qualify, that's all, is that you would wind up having Hamas running the Palestine National Council, which controls the Palestine Liberation Organization, and a Palestinian Authority president from Fatah and a Palestine uh, Legislative Council that, is, that will be responsible for overseeing the situation in Gaza and not Hamas. And so you, you, there's a lot of moving pieces here that, as I said, are very complicated. But insofar as unification, let me tell you, we're a long way away from seeing this picture resolve itself. Well, we've come to the end of an hour, a fascinating hour. 
And I want to thank all of you for coming. And I want to thank Zadine uh, for coming. Thank and um, Mark for presiding as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So